Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. I once again welcome you all to MSP lecture series on main group chemistry. In my last several lectures, I discussed about structure and bonding concepts. Now, today let me start uh, about the chemistry of main group elements. Before I proceed, uh, group wise looking into the chemistry of uh, uh, S and P block elements, let me begin with the chemistry of hydrogen. Hydrogen the simplest element in the periodic table and ambiguity is there about its position in the periodic table that means where it has to be placed. And before I dig deep into all these aspects let us look into the abundance of elements in the earth's crust as well as in the universe. So, I have listed here abundance of elements in the earth crust. You can see the most abundant element is oxygen accounts for 46.6 percent and silicon 27.7 percent. The third one is aluminum accounts for 8.1 percent, then iron 5 percent, calcium 3.6, sodium, potassium and magnesium account for respectively 2.8, 2.6 and 2.1 percent and rest of the elements constitute about 1.5 percent. And you will be surprised to see among these top 7 elements, hydrogen is not there. So, let us look into the abundance of elements in the universe. Okay. So, you will be surprised to see uh, hydrogen occupying the top position and then next helium comes and next oxygen and carbon, neon, iron, nitrogen, silicon, magnesium and sulfur. These are the top 10 most abundant elements in the universe. And you will be surprised to see both in the earth's crust and in the universe main group elements occupies major position and except for iron in both the instances uh, most abundant elements are essentially the main group elements. Uh, the percentages are percent by mass by the indicated element and solar system values are from Arnett's data. You may be surprised to know who is Arnett. Professor William David Arnett is an astrophysicist at Stewart Observatory, University of Arizona. He is an expert in supernova explosions, the formation of neutron stars or black holes etcetera. So, the composition of human body. So, now after getting some information about the abundance of elements in the earth's crust and the elements in the universe, let us look into the composition of the human body and what are the elements that are there in the human body in different form. In fact, it is very interesting uh, if you just look into the elements that constitute are essentially 6 elements. They are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus and sulphur. These 6 elements constitute the human body. The elements that are found in the earth's crust and the universe are essentially different from those that compose the human body. And human body is composed of 6 important elements such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus and sulphur. And nitrogen is a rare element on the earth, but is a major component of proteins the working molecules of life that is DNA, RNA and all those things. And let us look into the common elements in living organisms. In this most of these elements whatever I have shown in by mass in solar system. So, you can see here hydrogen is the major one accounts for 7.6 percent and helium 27.5 and iron is 0.12. That means, potassium, chlorine and other elements are present in the trace quantities. And you can look into the percentage of these elements in human body, hydrogen account 
accounts for almost 9.5 percent and carbon accounts for 18.5 percent, nitrogen accounts for 3.3 percent whereas oxygen accounts for 65 percent. Because uh, two third of our body weight is made up of water and uh, as a result what happens you can see hydrogen is present in 9.5 percent and oxygen present in 65 percent. And rest of the elements are as per the percentage I have given here. Okay. And of course, I have listed another table here uh, that lists the elements that are found in the human body by mass. Of course, here whatever the I have listed the top 10 uh, are very essential, rest of them are not really essential. Of course, iron is needed, fluorine is needed, but whatever I have shown in uh, second row and third row are essentially present. They may not be essential for human body but they are also found in human body for obviously two reasons. One is because of the food we eat is not pure, it is contaminated. The air we breathe is contaminated and the water we drink is contaminated. As a result, some of these elements which are essentially not needed uh, for human to have a good and healthy life still found. And of course, once if they are in the limit, uh, there is no harm and if they exceed certain permeable quantity then they can be very toxic and they can even kill the living beings. With this let me look into the more properties of hydrogen. Hydrogen atomic weight is 1.00794. For all practical purposes we can consider it as 1 and melting point is 252.9 degree centigrade and density is 0 0.084 and first ionization energy is quite high that is 13.598 electron volts and also it exists in two oxygen states that is plus 1 and minus 1 and its reduction potential is 0 electron volt and electronegativity is 2.2 which is slightly less than that of carbon that is about 2.4 or 2.5 and reduction potential of hydrogen is 0 as a result that is considered as a standard in determining the reduction potential of rest of the elements in the periodic table. Whatever we measure as reduction potential of other elements is with reference to hydrogen reduction potential that is considered as 0 electron volts. And of course, uh, you know the fact that it is the simplest element in the periodic table. However, the chemistry is vast and diversified and in fact it reacts with most of the elements in the periodic table uh, with the different uh, structural and bonding properties. Uh, because of its unique property, it is very difficult to place it in any group of the periodic table. Uh, simply by looking at the electronic configuration that is very similar to alkali metals having one electron in its valence shell we may think that it is appropriate to place it in the group 1 along with alkali metals. On the other hand, it is in short of 1 electron to have next inert gas configuration that is helium. So, as a result, it can be considered as an element belongs to group 17 that is halogens because all halogens have 1 electron short that is S2P5 electronic configuration and require just one electron to complete their octet to achieve the next inert gas configuration. That means now we have two options whether it should be kept in group 1 along with alkali metals by virtue of being 1S1 having 1S1 electronic configuration or by virtue of having one shot of inert gas configuration. It can also be placed along with halogens in the group 17. But let us look into some aspects here. Uh, as I said it is the simplest element. So, electronic configuration we have a dilemma where it should be placed along with group uh, 1 or group 17. Then H when an electron is added it achieves S2 electronic configuration that is that of helium. And then same thing happens in case of chlorine. Chlorine when it takes one electron it becomes chloride it goes from S2P5 to S2P6, but chlorine readily forms Cl- compared to H forming H- owing to the large electron affinity. And another difference between halides and hydrogen is halide ions are stable in water 
whereas hydrated ions readily hydrolyze in water. So, because of this difference in the uh, properties of hydrogen with respect to the halides, uh, eventually it was thought that it is appropriate to place it along with alkali metals in group 1. As a result, we find hydrogen in the group 1 along with alkali metals. So, now let us look into some more uh, properties. Let us look into the first ionization energy of alkali metals. I have listed here for uh, uh, 5 alkali metals starting from lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium and cesium and the values are given in kilojoules per mole. Lithium has plus 526, sodium 502, potassium 425, rubidium 409 and cesium 382. As expected first ionization energy is decreasing down the group because of the increase in the size of the atoms. Now, let us look into the first ionization energy of halogen series. Uh, I have placed here hydrogen along with halogens. For hydrogen first ionization energy is plus 13 12 kilojoules per mole. For fluorine it is 1681, chlorine 1251, bromine 1140, iodine it is 1008 and for acetatine it is 890 plus or minus 40. Uh, we do not have a precise value for acetatine because it is a radioactive element. And that means here if you look into the ionization energy of halogens is quite comparable to the hydrogen whereas, the ionization energy is not at all comparable with the alkali metals. Uh, the first ionization energy also I have listed here for first 20 elements here. You can see uh, ionization energy steadily increases uh, in a period whereas, that decreases in the group those things I will discuss more again as and when, when I go to the respective group. And let us come to the uh, isotopes of hydrogen. Three isotopes of hydrogen are known. Okay, the most abundant one is hydrogen also known as protium having one proton and zero neutron and it is a very stable isotope. And next isotope is having one proton and one neutron. It is also a stable isotope and it accounts for 0.02 percent that is deuterium called 2 H the symbol is D and third isotope is tritium 3 H symbol is T it has one proton and two neutrons and it is radioactive and half life of tritium is 12.26 years. Okay. And essentially this tritium is prepared by cosmic ray bombardment of 14 nitrogen in the upper atmosphere or in a nuclear reactor by bombarding lithium with neutrons. You can see that uh, equation I have given here. For example, it takes 6 lithium atoms and bombard with neutron you get 3 hydrogen that is uh, tritium plus helium. So, you get 1 hydrogen and 1 helium. So, all the three isotopes are chemically identical, but they react at different rates and this difference in reaction rate is used in the production of deuterium. Okay. As I mentioned 99.98 uh, percentage of water essentially as H2O and remaining 0.02 percent is essentially D2O and the sea water is essentially the source of uh, deuterium. And here there is an enormous difference is there in the rate of the reaction of these three isotopes. And of course, when we look into the reactivity of uh, other elements having more than one isotope, the rate of the reaction may not differ significantly. Whereas, in case of hydrogen and deuterium, the rate differs significantly because here the increase in the mass is almost 100 percent. 1 H atomic weight is 1 whereas 2 H atomic weight is 2 that means 100 percent increase is there. This kind of increase uh, in the magnitude may not be seen uh, in heavier elements as a result the impact of this one is very very minimum whereas in this case it is significant and this significance in the rate of the reaction is exploited in the isolation of deuterium from normal water. So, it, that means in every 6420 atoms of hydrogen one atom is deuterium and this accounts for 99.98 percent of uh, uh, hydrogen and 0.02 percent of deuterium mostly in ocean as D2O 
and of course, deuterium was first discovered in 1932 by Harold Urey. The deuterium to protium ratio found in comets is very similar to that in earth's oceans. This is one interesting observation. I repeat again the deuterium to protium ratio found in comets is very similar to that in earth's oceans that is 156 atoms of deuterium per million hydrogen. This also supports the fact that much of the earth's ocean water is originated from comets. There are some theories that say that some of the comets have hit the earth and through which water has been transferred from comets to earth and there is some evidence from these aspects that is deuterium to protium ratio in uh, ocean water is essentially similar to that found in comets. For example, uh, how we isolate deuterium plus uh, how we isolate or separate deuterium from hydrogen is by electrolysis of water. So, in electrolysis of water hydrogen gas produced is enriched in 1H and the residual water is enriched in heavier and more slowly reacting D. That means, when you perform electrolysis of water as more and more water is decomposed to give hydrogen and oxygen, okay, the residual water is left is essentially concentrated with only D2O. So, at some point of time this D2O can be taken out and separated. So, uh, the most abundant element in the universe next to helium is hydrogen, I repeat again and free hydrogen is very, very reactive and the majority of the element exists in combined state with other elements. That means, essentially in the free form it is not at all there in the earth's crust, however, it is in the combined form it is there and mostly in the combined form is mostly in the form of water. So, that means, uh, water, hydrated minerals and also as organic compounds. In organic compounds hydrocarbons of course, H is always there. And in brine we have and brine is nothing but a sodium chloride in water with percentage of sodium chloride varying between 3.5 to 26 and how uh, one can prepare hydrogen. So, essentially we have several methods at our disposal to prepare hydrogen. One is electrolysis of water, electrolysis of brine using mercury as an electrode, reforming of hydrocarbons, thermal cracking of hydrocarbons and hydrolysis of ionic metal hydrides, essentially alkali metal and alkaline earth metals which are highly electropositive and they are ionic uh, hydrides and they react violently with water liberating hydrogen. So, let us look into some of these methods. So, this is one method, it is electrolysis of water, you get H2 and O2. And then I mentioned electrolysis of brine using mercury as an electrode. Initially, brine as I mentioned is sodium chloride in water with percentage varying between 3 to 26. Initially sodium chloride is reacted with mercury to form sodium amalgam or sodium mercury alloy through the liberation of chlorine. This reacts with water to form sodium hydroxide plus H2 plus 2 Hg in solution. 
Okay. So, this, this is the method uh, used uh, to generate hydrogen from brine solution using mercury as an electrode and another method is uh, decomposition or oxidation of uh, uh, methane using a nickel catalyst. This gives a mixture of 2 H2 plus CO. So, the another method we have is coal gasification. Okay. So, here coal is treated with uh, steam at very high temperature using a catalyst. Okay. So, this gives essentially a mixture of CO plus H 2. So, this mixture is called syngas mixture. mixture. So, this syngas mixture okay, with steam using iron chromate at 673 Kelvin essentially gives okay, CO2 and H2. For example, you consider this CO gas or syn gas a mixture of you get CO2 plus H2. This reaction is essentially called water gas shift reaction. And of course, uh, yeah, besides this, okay, 77 percent of industrial H2 is from petrochemicals. So, 77 percent of industrial H2, the source is petrochemicals. And 18 percent from coal. Okay. And 4 percent from electrolysis I showed you in my previous uh, slide, 4 percent from electrolysis and 1 percent from some other sources. So, as I mentioned a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen in 1 is to 1 ratio is essentially called as synthesis gas or syn gas. It is used to synthesize other organic compounds such as methanol. Syn gas is also produced from sewage, sawdust, scrap wood, newspaper, etcetera. And as I mentioned by hydrolysis of metal hydrates one can generate H2. For example, consider alkaline earth metal uh, hydrate such as calcium hydride and treat this one with water, it gives calcium hydroxide plus H2 and similarly uh, take sodium hydride, treat with uh, water gives Or one can also generate by simply reacting magnesium with hydrochloric acid.
So, these are some of the methods that are used to generate or prepare hydrogen. One is electrolysis, another one is from reformation reactions and another one is by reacting most electropositive metal hydrates with water. So, in my next lecture, I will be discussing more about the chemistry of hydrogen. Uh, thank you and have a very present in Aryan chemistry reading. Swayam Prabha, Digital India, Educated India.